tubes. I think we've been caught red-handed. Are you are you the actual mastermind behind Forest Studios? No. Are you the are you the actual painter? No. I'm gonna give away all the secrets today? Maybe. Are you mad at me for waking you up? Yes. Do you wanna go back under the table? Yes, I do. Okay, no forced labor, no animals were hurt in the beginning of this introduction. Anyway, hi, it's Monday. I don't know what the weather's like where you're at, but here it's uh, snowing and soon to be turning to rain. And um, so I had to do a lot of errand running this morning and I got I got some stuff off and now I'm back and I'm tending to this piece which you may or may not have seen a Guns N' Roses uh, Welcome to the Jungle Lace TikTok video of yesterday's and if you didn't and you feel like being on Instagram good old Forge Studios is where you can hear that awesome guitar lead up intro to things um Maybe I'll bring this a little bit closer. I've I've featured I've featured this piece before, and that lights a little that lights a little bit right. Maybe I'll maybe I'll try and turn it down a titch, but uh, maybe not. We'll see. We'll see what it looks like because we have the technology. Oop, oop. There we go. But um, this is a piece that I started a while back, and I mentioned it in my little primer primer test drive video mind you i think i'm going to have a career of test drive videos but it's something that i've been working on and off for in between for i don't know a number of months now so it's not like i've actually been working on it every day but this past week i've had some homework to do as far as putting together a powerpoint goes and you're all invited i will post the information to a zoom um a small presentation for hartwood college uh, for Hartwood College, which is in upstate New York, and um, it'll I'll be talking a little bit about myself, and I'll talk about food and what food and ceramics means to me. That is a huge topic, so really, I'm just going to scratch a little bit at the at the outside of the iceberg, so to speak. But um, I just I just had a couple questions lob my way as far as. Um, China painting goes and again I am a completely self-taught not a buffoon I'm going to hold myself to higher slightly higher steam and pedestal but I kind of like technology I hit the buttons and then eventually they start working and um, I'm famous for waking up at like 5 6 a.m. with insomnia and just googling the crap out of everything and figuring out how to do things Again, um, you say Viscarda, I say Viscarda, Viscarda, Viscarda. Remus, I love you. Um, Remus, Viscarda. Uh, we have a we have Amico's now defunct China painting little palette tablets in common, but um, I've got a number of these special blue colors left that I like to use to paint up things. I'm slowly trying to integrate in some powdered stuff using a you know palette knife and grinding things down and then adding a, like a non-toxic I like the I like the non-toxic mediums I'm going with something out of it's now out of Florida it's a company called the good stuff and they've got a water-based medium that's slow medium or fast drying so you know if you think about oil painting and you want to leave the leave your your options open things can take a few days to dry or uh, they've even got one called a seminar medium which is I think they have workshops which I should probably do something like that to actually learn a little bit of something but so far so good so far so good I would say this piece you know on top of bisque firing a white glaze firing yes a white glaze firing is what I put on there um, I, I bet this has been in the kiln like a good 10 times. Again, I have a beautiful Conar kiln from Tucker's Pottery out of 
just outside of Toronto. And I love that, but it's bigger. So when I want to check things in a kiln faster, I picked up um, a, a, an old Duncan kiln and it's fabulous. I have yet to fix that, that little thing once in the last five years. It's, it's quite amazing. It can't, it can't get up to five, six so easily, but it's really great for knocking out anything under 04. So I white glaze to uh, cone five, six in, in the cone art. And, and then I just start, I don't, it's not that expensive to fire a kiln. So I, at least here. So I, I fire that, I fire the Duncan kiln quite frequently and often. So I'm popping in all sorts of, uh, doodads and, uh, as, as I go on. But I just wanted to talk a little bit. Oh, today's drinking vessel is brought to you by Peyton Koronek. P -A, I pulled it up, P-A-Y-T-O-N. I always forget if it's P-E or P-A. But this is a flamingo mug. And Koronek is spelled K-O-R-A-N-E-K. -E and it's got it, what I have deduced to be an underlying lays drawing on there of a flamingo one of my favorite weirdo birds and it's got this thick pink unctuous pulley glaze on it i do believe peyton you are still in texas and i hope you are staying warm and i thank you for today's uh today's tea time mm. but i had a question from uh another favorite texan marcia wiener hi marcia and she's always got lots of pointed questions about like why do you use an underglaze? Why do you use an overglaze? Why do you use a da 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 You can do you can do most everything in one go, I think. I mean I we've come a long way, baby. It used to just be a couple products out on the on the big old market. And I mean I I guess I'm old but I'm young in that I got into ceramics in good old high school in Vancouver and then but of course ceramics has been around forever. But the products have certainly changed. Um, so, but when I got to graduate school, I thought I was making colorful work. And my professor, Kirk Mangus, RIP, um, he said, do you think this, in his gruff cro tone, he said, do you think this work is colorful? And I said, sure, it's colorful. Look at all the colors. And so we took a black and white picture of it. And sure enough, because it was made from the same slip base and colored slips made from that same white slip base, Everything was grayed out and I went, ah, shit, look at that. Lesson one learned. So I was big on the, like those Duncan, I got a burp again, those Duncan, um, those little baby hobby ceramics or granny greenware, or depending on where you're from, they call them with this or that, probably full of a shit ton of lead, but you know, the best colors. And of course now they come in unleaded versions. So I started doing a little bit of slip work, but then actually throwing on, throwing on color work, or rather other types of glazes. And Kirk was a master at layering different things together. Over Christmas holidays, when I was there doing my graduate studies at Kent State, he made a hundred plates. And one of them I remember was uh, these small sort of breakfast sandwich plates. And it was matte black and it had this, kinky drawn of a cat face, lady cat face in it, and had six eyes. So it's black satin matte glaze. And then that motherfucker, he just puts clear glaze on the eyes. And so all of a sudden the eyes pop. And all of a sudden I was like, bingo, bongo, bing, bing, bing. I get it. And even though it was way before the times of even iPods, let alone cell phones, I got it that that layering was gonna gonna be my thing, and so even if your mind doesn't necessarily see or interpret or in, intellectualize uh, different layers of things going on, I think and, and sure there's some kind of scientific knowledge. And actually, I listened to an interesting podcast kind of about that this um, this past weekend on a food show called The Sporkful. But I think that your mind actually interprets these things very subtly and it changes your experiences, whether you're actually using, involving yourself in a piece or you're looking at it in, in a museum casing or whatever. 
there's just something about the glint, something about the different layered surfaces. One's matte, one's a, one's a little bit raised, you name it. The name of the podcast is called The Sparkful. And if you scroll down, it's the title of the episode is called Ice Cream for Science. And now, forgive me, I'm forgetting, but they went into, they, they talked to a couple of academics, one in particular, and they talked about, they, the, these kids of Dan Pashman, the host, served up ice cream on white plates and white plates and black plates. And of course, one guy was like, I think they're the same. And these kids are screaming, ice cream for science! So you got free ice cream if you tried, tried these ice cream on both plates and weighed in. And it was amazing that people were like, it's much sweeter on this one. It's much da-da-da on this one. It's much, much. And this one guy was like, I think it's the same fucking ice cream on both plates. And sure enough, it was the same ice cream on both plates. The point being, though, and the point that he goes through in the podcast, which I I don't care about spoiler alerts, so you're going to listen to it anyways. It's going to be awesome. But, like, you go into a restaurant, it makes a difference what you eat off of. It makes a difference the cutlery you use. I'm fascinated with airline cutlery. Remember, like, when you used to dress up and not just load your butt on a plane in your pajamas don't load your butt on your be fancy you know wear pants on the plane but back in the day when there were like upstairs downstairs wraparound bars and actual like metal fancy cutlery you can still buy that off of ebay i love it and they're like tiny they're like miniature sets but there's something about being forced to use ceramics in different ways that it enhances your food experience. I know a few friends who have no interest in eating. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Shovel food in your mouth, done, gone, go exercise, rock climb, uh, yoga, whatever. Uh, Bless you, bless you. I have no interest in in a lot of that, but I do have a huge interest in eating. And even though I am a solo entity for the time being, um, I do take it upon myself to serve my meals 99.9% of the time on an actual plate, I choose the plate. If it's brown lentil soup, what does that go in? If it is homemade tacos that I just spent two hours making, how does that get served? Um, the color combinations, you know, uh, I'm also, I, I'll get into the depression stuff at some time, but that's depressing, right? But I'm also, I'm also kind of a solo entity. So what am I gonna eat? How am I gonna photograph it? Who am I sharing it with? Who am I going to inspire to eat? Uh, last night, I really went to town because I was really bummed about the whole vaccination thing, i.e., when am I going to get mine? But then there's nowhere to go. So then my friend Cash had talked me off the, the, the ledge, so to speak, and was very kind to me. So I decided to make this shrimp aio, al aio dish that we used to have at a New York restaurant called El Faro uh, in New York City's West Village. Sadly, it is no longer there. I got I, I got a big heart on for like old vintage, old timey restaurant. Keen's Chop House in Midtown. There's no reason to go. Don't go to Times Square, but Keen's Chop House. If you can, j- just go there. And they've got these ceramic pipes on the ceiling. It used to be an old smoking club, like thousands of clay pipes that you used to walk in and put on the ceiling. Um, Check it out online, K E E and S. It costs you a fortune to go there, but it's so amazing. And the tile work on the floor, amazing. Anyways, it's not that I digress, but you've got the, you've gotten the point. You get the point that I like to go off on these tangents. But to Marcia, I say, you know, put put on the layers, put on the layers, and see what happens. Even if it's just on a test tile. Uh, in the in the low fire range, I brought a couple things here. I'm going to attempt Irene's middle name, Irene. Witzka, W-Y-T-Z-Z-Z-K-A, Lawson, and she lives in Washington State, and she is hardcore Amico gal, that YI Amico hashtag that floats around out there, and she has done some demos at Ensika, and I, I'm sure she's doing some stuff online. She makes the most beautiful wear. It may be very, oh, I might be able to catch it a little bit. It might be hard to see here, but this is, I do believe, Irene, a low fire clay body. And I'm not certain if, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it's just a clay body with clear, but she does this amazing underglaze job on here where, uh, and the dot, dot, dots on the butterflies are all like, 
I'm sure squeeze bottled on. And so when you use it, it has this almost, hmm, like, what do I know about Braille? But it's got this texture to it so that if you're holding it, and you sit in front of the TV and you're like pouring popcorn down your mouth or ice cream down your mouth or whatever down your mouth, you get to hold this and enjoy, you get to have a different tactile sensation that goes along with it. Um, I am not judgy as far as what cone you fire to. You, you, high or low, baby, work it all in there. Of course, I tend to work a little bit higher. I don't know how I got on that kick. I used to, I used, I really enjoy working with terracotta clay, but I have since gone to the cone five, six realm. And you know what it's like if you've got, you're working with white clay, any kind of porcelainous, porcelainous body in the studio, and then you got to switch over to red clay or whatever. And word has it on the street, my friend Sean McLeod's going to drop off some black stoneware, which I'm really excited about. Just a handful. I just want to squish around with it. So I'm going to have to create a situation there. But I just wanted to show you what you can do with underglazes. And she retains a huge amount of detail in there, which is quite nice. Sometimes I find uh, when, you, when you slap clear glaze over top of something, everything mutes and fades a little. Uh, this is not this is not like Amico versus Mako critique whatsoever. In my own personal work, I use a lot of uh, Mako stroking coats. I do like how it gets a little bit fuzzy, and not fuzzy, but it m melds in. So it's just a different choice of of what you want. Also, I'm sure it's really changed, but I sort of pay attention to the directions on the side of the bottle, and then I'm like, ah, eh, screw it. Been listening to lots of Dave Chang, you know, the restaurateur, and he has fully embraced the microwave. And before, I don't like the microwave because I like cooking. I like the long game of cooking. I like the whole slow game of cooking. But he, um, he has turned to the microwave and he brought on a microwave expert from MIT. And so it's like you learn the rules and then you break the rules and then you learn the rules and then you break the rules. So he's discovering he's doing far more home cooking than he ever used to. But now he's doing a lot of the prep work, like a lot of the shocking amount of prep work, like cooking entire fish, fish shiz, fish in the microwave, which is something that I, I don't think I will ever do. I have nothing. Basically this MIT guy said using your phone is a bazillion times worse than microwaving and also putting plastic wrap on top of what you put in the microwave he's like yeah it's not good but go go down the street and um you know knock on the gas plant's door or the oil business's door and you know shout at them he's like it's it's negligible it's a very interesting listen that in that way i sort of digress but what i'm saying is that directions are made to be learned and then broken my friend isaac Shu. Can you see his work? Isaac, where, where do you live? I forget. Why am I blanking out? Isaac lives in America. And we both um, own Enduring Images printers. So we have decals slash decals in common. And we often chat on WhatsApp about what's going on. What's going on in the world. He has their slightly newer system. And I'm very envious. But maybe one day I'll upgrade. And then we can really rub elbows but I just wanted to show you his work this isn't decal work so to speak I am thinking I mean there's there's some crazy bronze glaze on the on the handle there that's amazing and we finally got a chance to hug it out at Ansika uh, shortly after after you bought an enduring images printer but his pieces are this is like slip trail, something that I've never done. But I love this mug because A, it's huge, so it holds a lot of wake up morning coffee in there. But it's also just something to kind of lose yourself in. And again, I'm thinking that it's probably a glaze that's more or less flexible. I could see doing it in a Mako slip trail situation. I could see it doing it in a Duncan or Amico situation. So Isaac, whatever you're doing, it looks good on you. Uh, another person that I wanted to draw attention to is friend and fellow weirdo, Amelia Butcher. She is one wacky cat. And she lives in, also is from, are you from British Columbia? And she's not from British Columbia. 
she lives in British Columbia now and she makes the most fantastic sculptural work but she's also been endeavoring to make these burp functional pieces really I don't care if things are light I really don't care if things are light but these tend to be quite light they look like they're quite quickly thrown and she has she's an amazing illustrator drawer uh, she's working on some books with some publications with our friend Rick Nickel too but I especially love her subject matter it's so random it's so weird hockey female hockey players bugs this and that and so uh, I do believe that she is using some kind of oxide or underglaze situation on the raw clay surface and then popping this sucker into a soda glaze so you get like this bruised and battered and beaten situation it's fabulous it's fabulous i think one th i i'm just i'm not terrified of atmospheric firing but there's a randomness like can not that i'm a control freak per se but i maybe one day i'll try it maybe one day i'll, I'll be conned into to chopping wood and because now i know how to chop wood but um I think it, it, she's she's got an amazing handling of brush work and skills. So if you look up Amelia Butcher on the old Instagram, you can. I think she has a, a you know she has insights into her process and her draw, mad drawing skills too. So please do look that up. Uh, a couple more pieces that I just wanted to briefly show you. Again, homage to my my dear uh, professor Kirk Mangus and a couple of pieces that I acquired from him. I also came in to a gift of sorts from a former person in his life recently, and, and some of it's blue and white, some of it's his kooky um, wood-fired work, but this is, a, this is a vase. And look how, like, who puts that on? Who puts a smoking lady on a vase, right? She's having a, she's having a smoke with some alien creature, just some kind of weird head, Ella Philip Gustin, and you name it, it's all going on there. So here's an instance where I do believe Mr. Mangus has been using oxides on the raw surface. And here's another piece of his here too. And this, this is part of the gift that was gifted to me. I don't know, circle what? Nasty, nasty, ow, ow, ow. But it's oh so wonderful. There's some kind of strange cat in there. He's got a thing for dogs and poodles too. Sometimes people, people's uh, likenesses end up on the piece. Here's a lurking cat. Uh, so again, what he's doing is using cobalt, but what that crazy guy used to do was cut it with a little bit of red iron oxide. So where it's heavier, where it's heavier, it actually almost gets like I don't know if it's a combination of the cobalt and the oxide or the red iron oxide, but it takes on this extra special dark, dense, metallic feeling to it. That's I try to recreate that a little bit with these China painting works because Kirk's words were like eh, eh, little daggers into your head, like do not forget this, do not forget this opportunity here. And so again, he is one to have always wanted to create layers of information and depth, not only within his actual physical services, but his, the concepts and the actual forms. Um, they're pieces that are always going to be learning tools for me. I'll never be able to emulate this, but he also comes from an incredible line of um, instructors, you know, his instructors like Goro Suzuki and such who, um, who, who, probably almost physically beat it into him. You know, those were the good old school days when you could really take people to task. Not anymore. Maybe, thank goodness, maybe not. Anyway, um, I'm looking at the time here and I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I do. So again, in the previous video, I, I sort of talked about how I, how I got a hold of these things and a, a number of years ago. So. But China paint is China paint is China paint, kind of, sort of. You can get the powder. You can find the medium that you want. I would love to know how to make these into patty cakes like this and store them forever. I'll figure it out. Remus and I'll figure it out. I'm sure. I'm sure. But what I like to do is I like to, uh, I like to just dunk 
the colors that I need at the beginning of the day again while I'm making coffee, letting the dogs out and let them soften up a little bit. And then I come back and I take a brush and I give it a little mix. And this, like for you all, there's a tipping point where it's like too watery or it's too thick or it's too watery, or it's too thick. Ms. Marcia Wiener of Texas also asked, whoopsie, she also asked if I used tiny brushes. She thought maybe I used little one hair brushes to get some of the detail and design in the tiny painting work. What I find though is if you go online and you Google like Chinese underglaze or oxide painting, you will see the most beautiful brushes that are so bulbous. So they hold so much of the oxide and then they come down, if you can see, like a fine, like they come down to like a finer tip than this. It's just, they come down to like a single point. But what they, by an effect, by having a bulbous, you know, kind of carrier for all that, those oxides, it just sort of slowly funnels and releases. And then you can just endlessly draw and you don't have to keep picking up and picking up and picking up. It seems like a real wasteful kind of North American way of doing things, but meh, kind of cut things halfway, halfway. Again, I'm not cheap when it comes to food tastes and this and that. And except for I duct tape my duct tape my brushes together because they are sort of rather cheap brushes and they, they fell apart a little bit. But it's okay, it acts as a bit of a grip. But I do go for brushes that have just even the tiniest bit of like something something to hold some of the oxides. And then I have a I can at least make a couple of lines without just having to redab, redab, redab. I uh I'm I'll show you my, my totally informal setup. I know that there are some people out there who have these ingenious situations where they, they're like, they've got a contraption that's that's holding the vase on both ends and so they can kind of spin and work on it like almost in a lathe-like way. Ingenious, ingenious. But I also find that I'm always twisting and turning the pieces and contorting my body and I'm turning 50 this year. So I... I I just kind of go with it. I kind of go with the situation as best I can. So for for me, what I've been doing as of late, and it switches for every piece. It just depends on the shape of the piece. So I'll pivot this down here. And apologies that it's taken me so long to just get to, to a little bit of a point to, to talk about how, how I apply the color. Um, for the most part, it's not that this piece is done. Largely the detail and design work is done. Um, I want to fill it in with some more blocks of blue and then I want to put gold luster all over it and uh, not all over it but you know what I mean I really want to detail it the other thing to remember design wise is that pots often people put like a design on one side and they put a design on the other side and that's it you've also got the insides to worry about you've got the undersides to worry about you've got how your eye moves around the whole thing to worry about it's a lot of worrying or not worrying, maybe worrying is the wrong word. It's more like consideration. But what I do, I'll bring you in a little, bring you in a little closer, my special, special viewer. Uh, what I do is I lay this down as I lay me down to sleep. I'm gonna put a little, maybe a little bit of spongy sponge action here. Very high tech, duct tape roller there, and a little bit of sponge. And don't go anywhere, don't leave this and go to the bathroom and then leave it hanging because you know what'll happen, it'll roll off. And that happened to me once and boy was I upset. But I get a little bit of mileage out of these brushes. This one's red handle brush is a, a little bit thicker than this, than this other not duct tape brush, which is just probably on the brink of falling apart. But also, I mean, I keep a lot of, I, I, I cross the streams a lot. I don't keep a lot. <laughs> it's not a matter of not keeping a lot of things clean. It's just, I choose a dedicated, I choose a dedicated pan of something and I will fart around with it. And I don't mind adding and, and kind of, you know, adding some, some other tinges of, of glaze or colors to it because I'm not taking this piece up beyond uh, like 016 or so at least for these underglazes and I, I know there's a, range, a small range for underglazes that 
that you will that you will find out there on the market and you know of course you want to pay attention to what their what their firing range is this actually has a little bit too much black but for that reason i'm not going to add any red iron oxide because it's not going to get to a temperature for the two to meld and develop but uh, i'm adding the tiniest bit of black because as the as as my knuckles drag as my paint brush drags around here um, as it gets thick and thin, I don't know if you can see that. I should move that a little bit this way. Um, it, it gets a little bit, um, uh, as it's thinner, it, it appears more blue, and it's, as it's thicker, it appears more black. Here's a conundrum when your lines don't line up. So I know my lines aren't going to line up at all here. So always want to think about, like, hmm, ceramics and problem solving. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna match these up? So what I'm actually gonna do here, let's see if we can get even closer here, is I'm gonna, I've got a little bit of blank space left. And you know me, fear of, fear of blank spaces. I'm probably going to add, what have I got going on design-wise? The other key to, for me, for my ceramic success in my own pea brain is to not repeat patterns like going in the same way too much. I like to shake things up, I, but I also like to repeat parts of the design here and there so the whole piece has a, has a strange flow. Again, it's kind of like poetry, right? Or some kind of song that you've heard on the radio that comes back to a chorus. So there's certain patterns and designs that I will always repeat to give it a sense of continuity, but also diversity at the same time. And here I go, I'm just putting in some, uh, some, some talons or claws. And so what's gonna happen with that there is that I will, hmm, I can't really extend the finger too much further down there, but what I wanna do is uh, create a, distra a distraction of sorts. And you can see that I've kind of, oopsie, kind of done it under here where I have gone past where the, where the sort of rim lines are because they didn't match up again. And I put in my own thing. Oh, I know what I'll do. There's some floral components, little these little nub-dub floral components. So the, what I think I'll do here is that I'll just add something like that. And what it does is it creates a bit of a distraction so, so that it doesn't really matter that everything matches up, that the lines really match up. And I kind of like that because Again, that's what happens in, in real life, right? One eye is bigger than the other, or one eye is more squinty than the other. One boob's bigger than the other. I'm sure there's something about testicles that I don't know about or remember, but same, same. So I put that in there like that. So there, right? If I want to erase something, it's no problem. I just take a little bit of a bigger brush, wet it, smear it on my apron a little bit, and then, I, I mean, I can use a bigger brush or if I need a little littler brush, I'll go back in there and I'll pull it back. So, maybe, maybe I will use this teeny, teeny brush to get in there a little bit. You can also see that, uh, I think I mentioned it in the last video that there's a fair amount of just loose light shading that goes on. And I put this here so you can see it a little bit closer. There's a nasty hair hanging off of there. So um, let me add, I, it, needs, it needs, needs another knuckle or two here. For some reason this dragon is, and dragons aren't really my thing, but for some reason I like this one Ming well, there's a lot of sort of classic Ming vases with, with dragons on them. So this is, he's a, he is definitely a music aficionado hanging out there in the universe. And he's got some, uh, he's got some good, he's got some, kids got talons. I mean, talent. I had to get at least one pun in there today for you. So, again, maybe what, maybe you'll stick around with me for like one more little 
one more little talon of talent up here. As you can see, I kind of um, figure I had to divvy up the space a little bit. I mean, I'm no expert, but I have been sort of plucking away at this for a long time. So it's not that I have this innate understanding of space or design or anything like that, but I know in my head what I like. I know when I want to turn the corner of a vase that I'm that I'm looking at that I that I am pleasantly surprised surprised when there's some sort of incongruity or or strange design happening on one side of the pot or the other. So that's what I'm always aiming for. And with each new layer that I add, like when I'm going to block in some blues, uh, some like some solid blue sections, and then leave some space for some gold design, like I oddly get excited about that because what else are we going to get excited about these days? What else is there to do? Actually, I'm so, so thankful that we have ceramics and creativity to fill our days. I feel, very much feel for those people who have stinky office jobs and are stuck in front of Zoom cameras all day. So, and my kudos to you if, you, if you're teaching ceramics or any other kind of creative class right now, it's, it's I don't even know how you're doing it and I, I have no idea how the students are doing it, but but we're all gonna get through this. And we'll, you know what, there's gonna be pandemic linings. We're gonna make inter more interesting stuff. The problem with having doctions is that the stupid hairs get everywhere. Like somehow they just migrate all over the place. And I'm always picking them out of every, everything. So sometimes, you know, sometimes you just leave them in there. Here's my red handled slightly, slightly, um, wider brush. It's so slightly wider brush, but I've got this secondary pan of blue going on here and I've put a tiny bit more water, work that in there. So that's going to be my shady shade pan. So it's going to have a little bit of a lighter, lighter situation going on there. And then I'm just going to fill that in. The thing about China paints is that if you use too much, then it can, as friends have, and I, I haven't really tried, like tried a lot of the powders out yet, but I know that if you add too much at one time, like if, you, if your mix of medium to, to powder isn't right and it's too thick, sometimes you get like a cakey feel to things. I'm always a proponent of all mistakes can be happy mistakes. I'm sure, pretty sure Bob Ross has got a copyright out on that thought, but um, I'm always willing to kind of go with the flow and before, I quickly erase a whole section. I remind myself that I am a human being and that we do things by hand and ergo, we make a lot of mistakes by hand. But if you look at Chinese ceramics, if you look at historical ceramics, especially with illustration, it's full of flaws. It's full of wonderful, wonderful flaws. And I think that's part of the, why I'm attracted to the history of it is that it's like, it's our history. It's a, it's a, it's a slice of where we came from and how we learned to do things. So in the time that I did a few things and then come back to the shady shade spot, believe it or not, that should be dried up and I can add a little bit more detail there. That's what I love about these particular little pans of things. Um, such is not always the case if you're using the ground powder mixed with the, the more open mediums, the more, the more, and I'm just talking about the glycerin mediums. I, know, I have friends and colleagues who use the turpentine stuff. And so I'm assuming that they have a slower dry time. I know people who use uh, flat 7-Up or Sprite or what, whatever it's called, wherever you live. And that can be an interesting medium too. Uh, I know people who add a little bit of cornstarch to things to give it a little bit of tooth so that it, so that it doesn't... Like I find painting with straight up glycerin just mix in with your china paints. It's very slippery and it's very slidey, especially over like a glossy surface. So I find uh, having a little bit of tooth. It's like choosing your pencil strength. If you ever drew with pencils or like drawing with pencils, like I, I like a good, I like a good three B pencil. And I like grinding it in there. But I also love. I don't really, I don't really. Two B is just 
two B is too officey, but three B gets me going. Four, four to six, you know, then you can start smearing things around the paper. Sometimes again, you rift off of those strange accidents that get going there. So, so I'm always like consulting, like, oh, what's happening on that foot up there? Oh yeah, that's what's happening. So I do a little bit more. And I so hope you can see that. I just realized I might be painting a little bit out of your out of your scope here. But um you see that there? And then I can consult with some of the other feet to to bring in the same detail that's been been happening there. So a lot of them have this, this V-shaped design here that I'll bring back in. And then some of them, and then they have this little sort of reptile skin knuckle action going on here. And they have uh, these little circles of love going on here that I pop in. And then I just kind of keep going till I fill up that space. So you can see that it doesn't take long for an entire afternoon to be spent on doing just a couple fractions of things on a piece. And that's why they're millions of dollars. Just kidding. That's why they're gazillions of dollars. <sighs> we do it out of love. <laughs> I think sometimes, but uh, again, keeps me off the streets, the mean streets of Halifax, I would say. So I have finished up here. And again, hopefully you get a little gist of what's going on with things. And if you have any questions or if, if you want me to if you want me to potentially refilm any parts of this, I can. I'm just uh, I'm just a newbie at it all. So let me just add these little reptile things here before I lose my train of thought. Speaking of losing my train of thought, I did lose my train of thought the other day. And I meant to get back to you on something, but then I can't remember. I can't remember what that was. So. I guess, I guess I have to think about that on another day. Anyway, I'll leave that here because it's that's quite a bit of chit chat for from Monday, and you've got lots of things to do, and you've got uh, things to take pictures of yourself and and such. But I also do want to. Um, I'm just going to put this up here for a minute because you know me and knocking things over. I'll leave that here for a second. But I've been in contact with my friend. Mm -hmm. Let's not knock anything over here, Mariko. My friend Laura Vanderlyn, and she's also another Canadian artist. And I am happy she did not ask me to do this. This is of my own will and volition. But uh, I, oh, I'll try and post another picture of this, perhaps. Well, I'll, I'll do I'll do an actual post about it. But she made me this beautiful, beautiful denim apron with a you know so you can throw and sit down like that um i am going to do a little giveaway of at least one and uh they're like you know you you pay for what you get you get like amazing seamstress work uh they are only if you were to purchase one from laura vanderlyn pottery which i will tag too they're only a hundred dollars canadian and with exchange, that's about 75 American, something like that. But I gotta tell you, I've popped it in the wash a couple times and it's amazing, amazing, amazing studio apron. I also have an apron from a friend, Pauline Simpson, but that is my, I like that, I consider that to be my fancy apron. So I use it for cooking and such, and I will, I will model that at another time, but it's got amazing doctions and RCMP hats, you know, the Mountie hats on the pockets and such so 
it doesn't get to come down here as much. Sometimes it does. I've got a few stinky, not stinky, but like I got a few Ikea aprons and this and that. So depending on like what I'm doing, but what I particularly like about this apron is that it's super, super, super durable. I'm, I'm sure part of the giveaway will be at absolutely giving Laura Vanderlyn a follow. And then I would like to encourage something on my end, but maybe something different. Not just a regular, just just follow me, because you're you're probably following me, and I'm probably following you. Or maybe we maybe it should be like we should tell each other who we should follow. Like I like the idea of spreading the love. I don't. I like love, but I also like spreading the love. So watch for that in the next few days. I just put in an order with Laura for one, and um, and I'll and I'll organize my thoughts, and I'll finish up my presentation, uh, my PowerPoint presentation. I'll get back to you with that to soon enough. But that's a little bit about China painting and a little bit about overglaze painting and also underglaze painting. Just keep workshopping it. Comfort zones are good. Pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is, is also good. But just like sometimes just doing a combination of both and then, you know, focusing it back to what what makes you happy is also is also good. I mean, you know, it just depends how much studio time you have to to like actually be in your studio. You guys you guys have families and this and that. I just got the ding dongs down here who occasionally barf all over the place, but it's that's not too too much for me to manage. So I know that time is time is of the essence for a lot of you. But um, I encourage you to, you know, write questions and I always encourage oh I hear the postal guy upstairs. Uh, I gotta go. Um, I'm not I'm just gonna talk right through it. But uh, now I gotta go. I'm gonna talk to you soon. Okay, bye.